This is uh, an image by a Spanish photographer, Yare Gu, who is actually featured National Geographic. Uh, his expertise is what he calls chronophotography. He'll take uh, images of one bird in quick succession and flight. That's what this is. This is one bird with repeated images to capture the feel of birds in flight, uh, their patterns in flight, different patterns of birds. They look like uh, spirals, double helixes, uh, bad hair days, you name it. Uh, but I think what it expresses is, is the feeling that birds call to me. They beckon to me uh, both through their, their calls and songs uh, as ear music, but also through their flight path. Captured here as uh, eye music, which is uh, an old phrase that comes from Wordsworth. Next. Uh, and finally, uh, to kind of give an overview of the book, um, <laughs> this book is, uh, I guess, a book for all the ways that birds can fascinate our brains. It's a mix. It's a, a number of freestanding chapters that are interconnected. It's got the history of birds, literature about birds, the science of birds, humor about birds, uh, but also, as this captures, uh, <laughs> It's a story of my own personal transformation. I came to birding late uh, in my early 50s. Uh, birds quickly took over my brain. Uh, this x-ray of my brain is about five years old and I, I think the bird now takes up almost all of my skull, but there's still a little bit left. Next. So the presentation today is <coughs> kind of a tour of a few places in Massachusetts, uh, explorations of places, but also explorations of time. Uh, this image of St. Brendan the Voyager or St. Brendan the <coughs> St. Brendan the Navigator uh, is from a chapter called Birds of the Promised Land. And it's a way of expressing uh, a long tradition in Europe going back, this is going back to uh, a legend from the sixth century in Ireland, uh, but a long tradition of a land ac west across the ocean from Europe that was a kind of paradise, a new world, a new Eden, uh, a, a promised land awaiting people who could find it. Uh, this is one of the oldest stories. This is St. Brendan led a group of, uh, <laughs> according to legend, Irish monks in the sixth century. Uh, <clears throat> who went west across the ocean in search of the promised land of the saints. Next. St. Brendan and his monks had a lot of adventures. At one point they stopped and got off of an island to pray. The island turned out to be a whale or a gigantic fish. Uh, <clears throat> but the part most relevant to birding is they also landed on an, on an island called the Paradise of Birds. Uh, where they met a bunch of birds who said they were Lucifer's fallen angels and sang and spoke in Latin. Uh, they made a prophecy that uh, St. Brendan would never find <coughs> the promised land himself, uh, but that eventually his Irish ancestors, descendants would find it. Uh, I'm not claiming that uh, my Irish relatives were the ones who discovered North America. Um, or even my Norwegian relatives. Um, but I think it's just the sense that there's a, a long history of a belief in this kind of paradise of abundance. Next. Next. Another explorer who found the same kind of abundance was Christopher Columbus. This is a picture of his three ships. Uh, <clears throat> when he finally made it to the West Indies uh, and listened to the bird song, and he was actually one of the first few Spanish explorers who paid much attention to nature at all, much less bird song. Uh, but the West Indies to him in April sounded like Andalusia in Spain. Um, but before he got there, he was in bad shape. His GPS was off by about 6,000 miles. He was totally lost. Um, 
he was facing not only the failure of his expedition, uh, but likely mutiny by his crew and who had all become convinced that they would die in the ocean. Next. And what saved them literally was a bird or a flock of birds. <clears throat> As they approached North America, they saw some birds migrating south. They knew from that that they were finally close to land. They followed this migrating flock until they finally made landfall. I would say uh, to kind of follow up, the same thing happened in Massachusetts basically in 1630 when the Arabella came to uh, our shores which brought the charter that established the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and a group of Puritan settlers. Uh, they had the same sense of being lost and wondering if they would ever uh, <coughs> reach landfall. Uh, and a pigeon finally landed on their boat and then they saw some other songbirds and realized uh, correctly that they were close to shore and their destination. Next. Now, the actual discoverers of most North American birds were not Europeans, but people who had come from Asia across the Bering Strait, uh, dispersed across all of North America and all of South America, and <clears throat> had their own interests in birds and their own beliefs about what birds meant to them. <clears throat> I could go on and on about this subject, but the bird that stands out uh, most in their belief system was the common raven or northern raven. This is a picture my wife took at uh, Salt Lake City. Next. <clears throat> this is yours truly with a couple of uh, tamed ravens at the Tower of London. Uh, but ravens are not only very impressive birds every which way and of great interest scientifically, uh, they're probably the most important bird species in all of world folklore, uh, certainly in North America, but also in Scandinavia, uh, across much of Europe. Um, so they're, they're birds that have fascinated people and fascinated people in North America long before Europeans ever came to this place. Next. This is a slide of uh, a raven. Uh, a photo taken last year in Vancouver Island in Canada. Uh, I chose it just because of its whiteness because uh, that relates to one particularly fascinating Native American myth uh, that ravens originally were white. And there's actually different versions of this, uh, but often because of some misdeeds they did, uh, they were turned black. Uh, I would also say it's hard to underestimate the importance of ravens to some tribes, um, several myths in which the whole world was essentially created by ravens, uh, the whole world, including us. Next. Now I'd like to say more about uh, what birds meant to Native Americans in New England. Unfortunately, the historical record is very scant in this image uh, explains or expresses why that is. Uh, this is uh, a representation of the great pandemic or epidemic, which took over uh, New England from southern Maine all the way to Cape Cod between 16 and 1616 and 1619. Uh, <clears throat> again, it's hard to uh, underestimate the damage that was done by this uh, historian Ted Steinberg uh, said, and I'm quoting. It was one of the most dramatic population reductions in the history of the world. Uh, it's believed, the historians aren't certain, it's believed that this was mainly a smallpox epidemic, but there may have been uh, other diseases involved to which Native Americans had no immunity. So, you know, we have a little data about <coughs> what birds meant to tribes in New England, uh, but very little. Uh, this epidemic was followed by two major wars in New England, uh, <clears throat> the result of which is that the native population was almost completely exterminated by 1700. Next. So 
one of the uh, kind of three main stops in our tour here is uh, Cape Ann, but uh, we're going to ease our way there. Uh, but to carry on the theme I introduced earlier, uh, the kind of dominant impression of the early explorers and settlers from Europe who reached this new world, this promised land, was just the amazing abundance of birds. Uh, this is a colony of northern gannets. The explorer Jacques Cartier in 1534 uh, found an enormous colony in Newfoundland. These are birds that uh, <coughs> do come down our way. Um, do come to Cape Ann, especially if the uh, wind is blowing off the ocean. Sometimes they come pretty close to shore in Cape Ann or Plum Island or other places along our coast. Next. Uh, those, okay, that's, uh, those are some ravens, uh, excuse me, some gannets in flight. Uh, <coughs> I don't have video, but they're famous for their unbelievable plunge dives, which take amazing coordination so they don't destroy their beaks and their heads and their whole bodies when they dive into the water looking for prey. Next. Uh, another species that was extremely abundant when found by European explorers and settlers were great ox. And I'm going to read a passage uh, that kind of captures this sense of abundance. This is from the chapter of my book called Birds of the Promised Land. <clears throat> in Newfoundland in 1534, French explorer Jacques Cartier found island cliffs turned white by legions of nesting gannets. Flightless gray docks, these birds, wonderfully plentiful, fat, and easy to kill and waterfowl swarming at such density that, and I'm quoting Cartier, all the ships in France might load a cargo of them without one perceiving that any of them had been removed. <clears throat> Samuel Champlain described such bird plenitude that, quote, one could not imagine it if one, if one had not seen them. Next. Uh, this is a map made by Samuel Champlain. <clears throat> Uh, one of the first Europeans to uh, reach and explore is too strong a word, but get some impression of Cape Ann. Uh, this is Rocking Neck uh, in East Gloucester, <coughs> uh, which at that point uh, was eventually joined by a causeway, but was more of an island. Um, he called it Beauport or Beautiful Port, a name still used sometimes for Gloucester. Um, and I'm going to read a, a passage of his encounters uh, with the natives who live there. And this map actually, uh, I know it's hard to look at it carefully, but it shows uh, habitations um, from Native Americans in Gloucester at the time. Uh, it shows garden plots. And here's oops, a brief description. Um, Champlain called the place La Beauport, beautiful port. In the only firsthand European account of Cape Ann's Aboriginal settlers, Champlain described Pawtuckets dancing on shore in what he thought were Portuguese clothes. And he claimed better, they danced better after he gave them some knives and biscuits. He drew a map, this map, depicting habitations and garden plots around Gloucester Harbor and at his request, the natives drew an outline of the coast to the south to help him explore. Next. This is a painting of an ivory-billed woodpecker. Uh, these birds, as far as we know, were never in New England. Uh, but one interesting thing that Champlain and other explorers discovered was that there was a lot of trade between northern and southern tribes. So he did find northern tribes in possession of the bills of ivory-billed woodpeckers, which were used as coronets for, war <coughs> for warriors. And there was other, other evidence um, of trade between different tribes uh, <coughs> who had access to different birds that were in different parts of the country. Next. Champlain uh, on Cape Can, <coughs> on Cape Cod and Easton also described birds that uh, just astonished him and his crew, and this kind of note of amazement occurs again and again of 
in accounts by explorers. This is a black skimmer. Uh, the Europeans simply couldn't understand how birds with bills like that could ever catch anything or eat anything. Next. Uh, the other European, early European explorer who was very important in Cape Ann's early history is Captain John Smith. He arrived here in 1614. He wrote an account of his travels in New England. Uh, he was the first Englishman to actually construct a, uh, a list of birds in the New World. <clears throat> and he was the first European to name Cape Ann. He called it Trake. Cape, this is a mouthful, Traga Bigzanda. There's actually still a little road off the back shore with that name. Next. This is uh, Smith's map of New England. Uh, you'll see that <coughs> Cape Ann uh, is actually here, Cape Anna, but uh, King Charles thought. Uh, the original name was too barbaric, so it was named after uh, the king's mother. Uh, Smith is a, an interesting character. <coughs> uh, in some ways, he was a very accurate observer. Uh, in other ways, he was an unreliable narrator. For one thing, his history was not really simply a history or an account of New England, uh, but what one critic described as a real estate brochure. Uh, <coughs> You'll see in the upper left-hand corner, hard to read, but uh, he calls himself the Admiral of New England. Uh, he was basically trying to entice uh, Englishmen to come to New England um, and to hire him to bring them here. <coughs> uh, he painted uh, a pretty rosy view of New England, mainly by omitting winters. So uh, it looks like a description of a subtropical land. Uh, but even the name he gave it uh, kind of reflects uh, Smith's reputation as a, a teller of tall tales. Uh, one, I find it pretty amusing pattern is that uh, if you read his various adventures time and time and again, uh, he's been captured, he's on the edge of being executed, and some beautiful brown skinned woman just can't resist his charms and saves him at the last minute. So. Uh, one of those was Princess Dragobigzanda, another one was the Lady Kalamata from the steppes of Europe, and the most famous to us was Pocahontas. Uh, he had such a reputation for this that uh, one critic in England made fun of him at the time as the White Othello. Next. But Smith did report on the birds of Cape Ann. I, I often uh, if I'm scoping for birds in winter from the back shore of Gloucester, you know, drift off into a fantasy where I imagine myself on Smith's boat looking toward what on shore would have looked uh, like a wilderness to him. Uh, but one species he saw was this bird, bufflehead, uh, which gets its name because some people at least think it looks buffalo headed. Uh, they're also called spirit ducks just for their sprightliness and liveliness and sociality. Um, if you see them well, as in this photo, they've got some beautiful iridescence on their face. <clears throat> Next. Uh, another bird he saw, and this is uh, a recent picture by, from my friend Pam, uh, is redneck grebe. This is uh, Really an interesting picture because this bird has been around uh, off Niles Beach in Gloucester this summer and beautiful blooming plumage, <coughs> beautiful breeding plumage. Uh, usually we only see this bird in a drabber winter plumage, but this individual is stuck around. It actually took me some research to track down uh, that this was in fact one of the birds that Smith saw. Um, he calls them dive toppers. Uh, but a lot of birds, uh, seabirds, die for their prey. But <clears throat> I finally found uh, a reference clearly to grebes, could be either redneck grebe or horn grebe uh, in Shakespeare, who called them dive dappers. So pretty certain this is one of the species that Smith saw. Next. Now, Smith didn't see or claim to see this, which is not a bird. 
Uh, it's more of a mythological half bird, half lion creature called the griffin. Uh, I've used this slide just to illustrate uh, with Smith and a lot of other European observers, uh, terminology can become a real issue in figuring out what birds they were looking at. Uh, Smith admitted this himself. Uh, at one point he says, I know not what I saw, uh, especially birds of prey. One term he uses is grip, G-R-I-P-E, which has the same derivation as griffin. Uh, this creature, uh, it's a term that's been used kind of very loosely to describe many raptors, but he also says he saw eagles and hawks, suggesting that uh, grip was something other than that, but we don't really know for sure. And that's true of some of the uh, seabirds he saw as well. Next. <laughs> now, Certainly of all the birds that were found by European explorers and settlers, the one that's really amazed and startled them was the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, William Wood, an early uh, settler in New England, uh, described it as, quote, the miracle of all our winged animals. <coughs> uh, they also found Native Americans with earrings made from hummingbirds. Next. Uh, I'm including this slide, uh, which is a hummingbird moth, a photo my wife took in Arizona. Uh, not a bird, but uh, many of the first observers of hummingbirds actually thought they were insects. There aren't any birds that are anywhere similar to that in Europe, and it took them a while to realize these uh, miraculous creatures were in fact birds. Uh, I would add that even early in the 16th, 17th century, there was already a thriving pet trade uh, in England for birds. Uh, a lot of people captured uh, hummingbirds and shipped them back to Europe. Very bad idea. Uh, very few of the birds even lasted the voyage and those that did make it to Europe uh, almost all died within a few days. <laughs> Next. <clears throat> One other bird that captured the attention of early settlers, but not New England. Uh, although eventually New England was this bird, the northern mockingbird. Uh, this is actually one of a number of southern species that uh, eventually found its way to New England, but certainly not in the 17th century. Uh, but this was the first songbird that was actually named in North America by Englishmen. It was also the first songbird misnamed. And this is a pattern that occurs again and again. It's, uh, it's named for quite a long time was the Virginia Nightingale, uh, because in not so much in appearance, but in its song and its mimicry, it resembled the Nightingale of Europe, <coughs> uh, but it, it's not closely related. Next, but whoop, did we miss a slide? Yes. Uh, <coughs> This is a bit later, but uh, mockingbirds have been a favorite of uh, many people for a long time. Thomas Jefferson had a pet mockingbird named Dick that he talked to all the time. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who has a strong KPN connection because he lectured here, <coughs> uh, was also fascinated by mockingbirds, but he couldn't have seen them in Rockport where he stayed at the Emerson Inn. So, uh, I tried unsuccessfully to track down where Emerson actually saw mockingbirds. Next. Uh, the last, uh, before we leave Cape Ann, this is a green heron. Um, I think one thing that struck explorers and settlers were just the beautiful wading birds of the Western Hemisphere that they had their own waiting birds, but not this one. This is one of my favorite birds just because of its beauty. Uh, it also has the rare trick of using bait to fish. Not many birds do that. Next. So I promised you uh, some humor. So before we leave Cape Ann, a quick humorous interlude. Uh, there's at least a lot of attempts at humor in my book, generally at my own expense, uh, often at the expense of what I would call my orthopedic birding adventures. Uh, this is Dogmar Breakwater in Eastern Point. Uh, after one surgery uh, where I felt I was living under house arrest, I think we all know that feeling these days, 
Uh, I got stir crazy in the middle of winter. Next. So I did this. I took off in my crutches and my cast and walked the length of Dog Bar Breakwater uh, with this gull in my crutch giving me a hard time. Uh, my wife was by my side. She's a nurse. In this case, she was more uh, sort of a combination of my enabler uh, and my protector in case I fell off the edge. Next. But this journey up to Breakwater was well worth it because at the very end, this is what I discovered. Uh, a flock of purple sandpipers. This is uh, actually a photo by Chris Chacon, not my, <coughs> uh, not my photo, but uh, I got so close that I could actually see why they were called purple because they do have sort of a lavender tinge, but you have to get close to see that. <coughs> uh, I counted 153 at the end of the breakwater, uh, by far the most I've ever seen at one time. Next. So now all I had to do was get back to my car going back down to <coughs> the breakwater. Uh, I, I did tell my orthopedic surgeon about this. Uh, I can't describe the expression on his face. He simply said, what were you thinking? And I answered, birds. Next. So <coughs> we're going to leave Cape Ann behind, although this actually is still in Cape Ann and West Gloucester. but. Uh, our next second major des uh, destination is the Great Marsh, uh, which extends from its uh, kind of southern end in Gloucester, the marshland, uh, all the way up the coast into New Hampshire, uh, the most extensive salt marsh in our state. Next. This is actually a photo of Marsh in the distance at, uh, taken by my wife uh, at sunset at Canomo Point in Essex, which is part of this marshland. Next, uh, another photo taken by my wife, who's an excellent photographer. This is the Cox Reservation, a Greenbelt property, uh, <coughs> also in Essex. And I'm going to read you. Uh, a short passage here. Um, you know, I'm native to Illinois. I'm not a native New Englander. Uh, I fell in love with the ocean, but the, the more I've been here, which is about 50 years now, I've really come to love salt marsh. <laughs> and I'm going to read you a passage that uh, tries to capture that love. This is from a chapter in my book called The Great Marsh. It's this reaching and creeping I love, life grasping for root holds, the endless rise and fall of water, the marsh inching inland and receding, the boundaries ever shifting, plants ever colonizing like eelgrass capable of complete submersion, animals finding homes, a world in flux. On a gray mud flat under solemn clouds, the sun comes out and transmutes a mud puddle into a reflective pool of sun, shining cloud, and a great blue heron lifting off. Mary is by my side, light passing through her hair. Feeling swoops into space inside me. Around us, ocean flows into bay, estuary into river, marsh into solid land. Each day is as changeable as the seasons, each season distinct, the sumac reds and matted grass chartreuses in autumn, as beautiful as our maple, maple forest. I take Mary's hand. So that's that's how I feel actually both about marshland and my wife. Next. Now one species uh, I've seen at the Cox Reservation uh, is this an eastern meadowlark. Nice photo by my friend Phil Brown. Uh, you'll occasionally see the species in salt marsh, but it's not really a, a salt marsh species. Uh, best place I know of in Essex County to find uh, a meadowlark is Coxwell's Grant, uh, historic New England property in Essex. <coughs> uh, grassland birds in general are in decline in our states, losing their habitat, and meadowlark is certainly one of those. Next. Now this species absolutely is a salt marsh species. Uh, this is a glossy ibis. <coughs> 
Uh, people sometimes talk about their spark birds, the particular species that spark their interest in birding. Uh, I hate to uh, narrow it down to just one, but certainly this would be high in the list. Uh, as I said, I didn't take up birding until my early 50s uh, when my athletic career was ended. So I started biking for exercise. Uh, within a few miles of my house, I came across glossy ibises. Uh, I was actually both astonished to see such gorgeous birds that close to home and also embarrassed. Um, how, I had, how could I have been so unobservant for decades as to not have noticed these birds? Uh, they seem like creatures that should be uh, Paleolithic or from Nubia in Africa, uh, not three miles away in Gloucester. Next. And another species uh, I quickly fell in love with is little blue heron. Um, a good place to see these is a pond on Bray Street in West Gloucester, which is a couple miles from my home. So I'm and actually, if you're really lucky, you can sometimes see them and all their variations from juvenile white to this color to kind of calico blue and white in between. Next. This is a photo of a willet by my friend Shiloh. Um, and this is truly a characteristic uh, bird of the marsh, salt marsh. Uh, it's distinctive uh, willet cry is really the, the, the flight call of salt marsh. <laughs> it is uh, these birds in breeding season don't shut up. You can hear them all the time. Um, you hear a willet, you've got salt marsh around you. Next. Uh, one of the treasures of the Great Marsh is, <clears throat> this is an overview of Crane Beach in Ipswich, uh, very long history of being a popular birding spot. Uh, if you look at older records, you'll see references to the Ipswich dunes, that means uh, Crane Beach and the dunes around it. Uh, <clears throat> My friend Jim Barry and I lead an annual walk uh, for Cray, at Cranes um, for the Brookline Bird Club and Essex County Ornithological Club. Uh, actually, Jim is the leader. I just kind of take along as the uh, quippy sidekick with a spotting scope. Next. Uh, one of our target birds is this, uh, Pipe and Plover. Uh, this is actually a piping plover multiplied uh, <clears throat> with offspring. Uh, great picture by my friend Christopher Chacon. Uh, I think one of my favorite birding moments only was uh, <clears throat> uh, a day that we came across uh, piping plovers like this, kind of multiple plovers with a lot of legs. Uh, and some friends of mine had come along to join our group and they had uh, a daughter, Brenna, who was I don't know, five or six years old at the time. Uh, not that enthusiastic about birds, but like the beach. But when we came upon these birds, her father held her up to the spotting scope so she could see them and she looked kind of befuddled for a while. And then her eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger as she realized, <coughs> realized that this was a whole family of pipe and plovers that she was looking at. Next. Uh, <coughs> Not too far from uh, Crane Beach is one of my favorite bicycling routes, which takes me uh, <coughs> along Sart Marsh and Salt Hay Fields in Newbury. Uh, this is actually a long, uh, a popular subject for New England landscape painters, probably the most famous and most identified with salt marshes is Martin Heed, who painted this in Newbury in the 19th century. Um, next, and close to this on the Newbury uh, <coughs> Raleigh border uh, is a bird that birders look for every year, uh, Wilson's phalarope. Um, of the three phalarope species, this is the only one that breeds uh, east of the Mississippi and the breeding area in the Massachusetts salt marsh. It's kind of an uh, isolated breeding area. Uh, this is a female, kind of uncharacteristically of birds. The female is flashier looking uh, than the male. Uh, these birds, 
along with a small other group of species are famous for, uh, I guess what you call gender role reversal. Uh, the males do all the incubating of birds, all the feeding of young. Um, females lay the eggs and then take off looking for um, other males. Sometimes the females can be very uh, aggressive in pursuit of their mates. Uh, there's a lot of humorous passages in birding history of, uh, I guess, humorous if you're not a male phalarope, of females um, <coughs> kind of intimidating, thrashing males around, uh, sometimes almost drowning them. I, I must say I've never met a human fe female who didn't like phalaropes. Uh, there are also comical stories with both phalaropes and jacanas of scientists uh, with gender stereotypes uh, who were actually baffled. They just couldn't believe that these were female birds because they didn't act like what they thought females ought to act like. Uh, although the fact that they laid eggs kind of gave the game away. Next, I do a lot of birding by bicycle. I think probably my famous, most favorite place is Plum Island. Uh, every year, Mark Burns and Laura De La Fleur lead a uh, Brookline Bird Club bicycle tour of Plum Island. That's me on the right. Um, great place to bike, bicycle. We, we usually stop when the pavement stops and don't do the gravel section. Uh, I could do a whole session just on birding Plum Island, which is good in all seasons, kind of every part of it. It's got some variety of habitat. Uh, and special birds in each of those habitats, but just to uh, <coughs> give you a few highlights. Uh, next. Uh, one is that uh, every year there's a pair of uh, ospreys uh, that nest on a platform nest. Uh, ospreys, along with peregrine falcons and some other birds, bald eagles, uh, were in serious trouble because of pesticides which would thin their eggs. Um, but I think we haven't gotten rid of pesticides, but there's been a great reduction. Uh, these birds have recovered. They're now much more common again as breeding birds in our state. Uh, they're beautiful birds. So uh, they're one of our modern conservation success stories. Uh, they're also a source of, uh, I don't know, you can draw what lesson from this you will. Um, one time I uh, showed up at Plum Island and I was, I think it was early in spring and I was uh, looking to see whether the ospreys had returned to their platform nest. So uh, I got out of my car. Uh, this couple came running at me all giddy, all excited, saying they'd just seen a pair of bald eagles <coughs> um, on top of the platform. So I said, well, maybe, but uh, that platform is known for the ospreys that nest there every year. Are you sure they were bald eagles? No, no, they were sure bald eagles. So I got my binoculars and got close enough so I could see the platform and saw two ospreys up there. Uh, I pointed this out to the couple. No, no, bald eagles, they were sure of it. Uh, so I got out my Sibley Guide to Birds and uh, very carefully pointed out all the uh, field marks and distinctions between bald eagles and ospreys. Nope, nope, still bald eagles. Uh, I finally got out my spotting scope at 32 power magnification and uh, urged this couple to look at these, ball, <coughs> these birds uh, at their leisure, but they remained bald eagles to the very end. Next. Uh, one of the characteristic birds of Plum Island uh, and a true salt marsh lover is this northern harrier. Uh, there's a number of harriers around the world. Often they are marsh lovers, um, especially in winter. You can see this bird often gliding uh, very low to the ground, just looking for prey. Next, uh, the harrier's arch rival, um, although this doesn't show a harrier, is a short-eared owl, uh, another salt marsh specialist. This is actually an amazing picture of a short-eared owl uh, having a rough tumble with an American kestrel. Uh, short-eared owls are, I think, usually visit Plum Island every year. Sometimes they're scarce. They can be hard to see. Uh, <coughs> to use the formal term, they're crepuscular, which means 
they generally come out at dusk um, and then stay out till dark, but that this is a bird that uh, birders will, uh, and photographers will come to uh, Plum Island every year in hopes of seeing one. Next. Uh, back up one, I think. Yes. Uh, there are also songbirds uh, at Plum Island and one bird that's most definitely a salt marsh specialist, as its name indicates, uh, is this bird, the salt marsh sparrow. Uh, I'll mention this again later, but uh, this is probably of all our breeding birds in Massachusetts, the one that is most seriously threatened. Uh, it's threatened because its habitat is being drowned by rising sea level. Uh, I've talked to a few biologists who, you know, made the glum prediction that this is probably the <clears throat> next species in our state most likely to grow uh, extinct. Uh, and finally, we'll leave Plum Island with this. Uh, this is a group of tree swallows in migration. Uh, <clears throat> This, the spectacle of tree swallow migration uh, is one of the great spectacles in birding in many places in Eastern Mass. Uh, uh, this is already in progress. Uh, sometimes you can see thousands upon thousands, too many thousands to count all, all over the marsh. Uh, and one summer, um, this may sound like an Alfred Hitchcock experience, but it was actually totally exhilarating. Uh, I was recovering from an orthopedic surgery, uh, finally was able to get back in my bicycle again, right in the midst of the swallow migration. Uh, I picked a lucky day. I rode the length of the paved part of Plum Island uh, and rode through thousands and thousands of tree swallows uh, just all around me, an absolutely uh, exhilarating experience. So if, if you've never seen uh, hordes of tree swallows in migration, it's a spectacle you should not miss. Next. Now going a little further afield, uh, I'm not even gonna be able to get to central and western Massachusetts tonight, but um, this is one place I did not want to omit. This is Mount Auburn Cemetery, which is on the border of Cambridge and Watertown. Uh, this was opened and consecrated in 1831. It's basically a vast graveyard garden. Um, it led, uh, kind of led the way for a whole uh, rural cemetery movement. It sort of revolutionized the whole concept of cemeteries um, as a place for beauty, spiritual reflection, uh, social gathering. Uh, at one point, it was the third or fourth greatest uh, tourist attraction uh, in the whole country uh, after, I think, uh, George Washington's home in Niagara Falls. Um, it's still a very popular place to visit. Uh, to me, it's a place where kind of everything in my book comes together. Trees, flowers, birds, beautiful sculpture, uh, and also many people who are famous in American history. So. <laughs> If you've never been to Mount Auburn uh, and you live in Massachusetts, you absolutely must get there at some time. Next. Now, I've, <laughs> I've got a chapter in my book about Mount Auburn, uh, and I try to connect the history uh, and the birds there. And I actually started uh, <laughs> with the gravesite of Harriet Jacobs, uh, who is an escaped slave and author. Um, I had taught a book of hers uh, in my career as an English professor and a course on American literature. Uh, her inscription of her gravestone reads, patient in tribulation, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Next. The book she's known for is called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, uh, a remarkable book I'd strongly recommend. Uh, probably the most remarkable part is that she was being hounded sexually uh, by her master, um, finally to the point where she faked an escape, uh, and instead of actually escaping, she spent seven years hiding in a garret um, that was very small, much too low for her to stand up in. She actually <coughs> made some peepholes so she could look out in the street. Um, this was, her hiding place was a total secret. 
uh, even to her two children. The only one person who knew about it was her grandmother. Next. And when I, she doesn't describe birds in her book, but I've often thought of her <clears throat> alone, seven years in a garret. Um, she must have been able to at least hear bird song, um, perhaps see some birds. One bird she probably would have heard is this, an indigo bunning. And I think this kind of captures to me what Mount Auburn is about, how history and birds come together. Uh, the day I visited her gravesite, as I was standing there reflecting on her life, <coughs> I heard the very characteristic two-note song of an indigo bunning uh, right over her gravesite. Next. <coughs> now, not far from her site is this statue by uh, a famous sculptor, Martin Milmore. <coughs> Uh, this is often called the Copenhagen uh, Angel. It was in honor of the memory of his daughter who died young. Um, Mount Auburn is filled with angels and like some of the other sculptors, Milmore paid a lot of attention to uh, the construction or structure of feathers on birds and uh, his angels are often uh, kind of very true to the feather patterns of actual birds. Um, the day I left, uh, walked away from this statue, and this is what happens all the time. Uh, I quickly found this bird. Next. This is a beautiful great crested flycatcher. This was uh, <coughs> very close to uh, a famous memorial to Mary Baker Eddy, founder of Christian Science. I'm going to come back to her briefly later. Next. Probably the most famous sculpture at Mount Auburn is this, the Sphinx. This is a combination woman, eagle, lion, uh, also sculpted by Martin Milmore. <clears throat> and I'll quote the inscription. American Union preserved, American slavery destroyed by the uprising of a great people, by the flood of fallen heroes. Next. A bird I found very close to here, and again, this is uh, in the spirit of both Mount Auburn and my book. Um, this is the Canada Warbler. Uh, this bird has personal meaning to me because I associated with my brother uh, who lived in Canada, who died about 10 years ago at a time where all four of my surviving siblings died within a year. So I've got a chapter uh, called Death in the Rose Breasted Grosbeak, which is a reflection on trying to bird as a way to deal with grief um, and how each of uh, my siblings became associated uh, emotionally with certain birds. Uh, in this case, my brother uh, lived in Windsor, Ontario, uh, so it's fitting uh, Canada warbler, but uh, when I uh, went to <coughs> As I was writing his eulogy, I was walking through a field and came upon the species. Next, uh, Mount Auburn has a long history as a popular place for birders and bird, bird clubs to go. This is actually a group of Brookline Bird Club birders from the year 1960. <coughs> Next, uh, one reason Mount Auburn is so popular is that it's a migrant trap. It's a large green area and an urban area. Um, probably the most famous spring migrant trap in all of Massachusetts. Uh, so birders come here in May to look for various migrating birds, but especially warblers. Uh, I could show you a whole long list of beautiful warblers. Uh, this is a mag magnolia warbler actually taken in Marblehead by my friend Rob Kipp. Next. Another species birders look for is scarlet tanager, and I've had best luck with this uh, very close to the highest point of Mount Auburn, which is uh, Washington Tower, named after George Washington. Uh, I've seen it uh, a few times right below the tower. Next, this is uh, a kind of characteristic Mount Auburn photo, not a rare bird, it's the Northern Cardinal. Uh, but all the paths uh, in Mount Auburn are named often after trees or flowers. Uh, Northern Cardinal, like Northern Mockingbird, Tufted Titmouse, is a species that uh, used to be far more southerly. 
um, and has only uh, you know, moved up to New England within the last century. So uh, if you look through records of birding triplets from 80, 90 years ago, you won't find mockingbirds, you won't find cardinals, you won't find Carolina wrens, you won't, it was a big deal when finally somebody saw a, car, a tufted titmouse on a Brookline Bird Club trip. Uh, next, um, I mentioned the Mary Baker Eddy Memorial. Uh, this is a red-tailed hawk perched on the top of it. Uh, these birds, I was kind of surprised to learn uh, were relatively late arrivals, um, kind of late generally in becoming, uh, they're now our most common hawk, uh, but it, it took them quite a while to become that common in Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, the first pair did not nest in, in Mount Auburn until the very early 21st century, uh, less than 20 years ago. Um, kind of in line with all the literary associations about Auburn, they were named Hamlet and Ophelia. Although I'm not, well, since both characters die before the end of the play, uh, <clears throat> perhaps uh, not the best choice of names, but nice literary aura. Uh, next. And as we leave Mount Auburn, uh, this is the view from Washington Tower, the highest point, beautiful view of the Boston skyline, part of Cambridge, that's uh, <laughs> first building in the foreground is Harvard Stadium. Next. Now, since I'm a retired English professor, uh, my book is, I would say, strong on literature. <laughs> and before we uh, leave our tour, I'd like a little literary interlude. Uh, this actually is connected to Mount Auburn. This is Emily Dickinson, who spent her life in Amherst. Uh, but I think not only our state's foremost poet, but our state's foremost bird poet. Uh, she did visit Mount Auburn as a teenager and absolutely loved the place. Uh, a lot of other writers uh, who lived around Cambridge visited much more frequently, <coughs> frequently like Emerson and Thoreau. Next. Now, Dickinson loved and identified with quite a variety of spe species, but I think her favorite by far uh, were hummingbirds. Um, she actually, it was common practice in those days for visitors to leave calling cards. She sometimes uh, <coughs> signed her calling card hummingbird. Next, Oop. next. Um, and there's kind of a fascinating story. Dickinson, you know, sometimes is thought of as a solitary creature, uh, but she was part of a circle of uh, literary and artistic friends who were often bird lovers. Uh, one of them was Martin Heed, who I showed you earlier, the Hayfields of Newbury. Uh, but he's maybe most famous for his paintings of birds and flowers in South America. Uh, this is a painting by Heed of some hummingbirds and some flowers in Brazil. Um, Harry Peter Stowe, who at one point uh, rescued a, a hummingbird and nursed it back to health, was part of the circle of friends. Uh, next, Dickinson associated with hummingbirds with one of her favorite words, evanescence. Uh, she wrote several hummingbird poems, but I'm going to just read you this one. It's very short, kind of captures the whimsical quality of some of her poems. <clears throat> a root of evanescence with a revolving wheel, a resonance of emerald, a rush of cochineal, and every blossom on the bush adjusts its tumbled head, the male from Tunis probably, an easy morning's ride. Next. And I'm gonna leave you with other, one other uh, Emerson poem, or uh, Dickinson poem, sorry. Uh, this was probably too small for you to read. Uh, but one thing I think underestimated in Dickinson's poetry, uh, she has some poems that uh, can be bleak or at very least very introspective, um, kind of questioning what it all means. But she also had a playful, whimsical streak and there's certain birds that brought that out in her. I think uh, one for sure was the bobolink. This is one of her bobolink poems, <clears throat> so I'll read it to you. Uh, this is about basically uh, spending uh, Sunday not going to church, but hanging out with bobolinks. 
Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings and, if, and instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches, a, God preaches a nodal clergyman and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. Emily Dickinson. Uh, I would also add before we leave her, she has another very funny bobbling poem uh, <clears throat> that involves a kind of wise ass bobolink uh, who visits a bunch of drab Presbyterian birds having a very dull Sunday and kind of uh, rouses in into a spirit of humor. Next. So heading into the conclusion of the presentation, uh, this is a New Yorker cartoon. Uh, I guess at my age, I could take this personally. Uh, tick tock, tick tock, time is moving on. Um, but in some ways for birds, time is running out for a number of species. <laughs> Next, I often find myself uh, kind of thinking back to St. Brendan in the sixth century um, and to other early explorers and what happened to all this abundance they were amazed to find uh, in the paradise of birds in the new world, and the, the promised land they finally found. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's not a pleasant story. Next. Uh, great ox with at one time astonished uh, Europeans with their abundance uh, are now extinct uh, along with some other birds that uh, early settlers found like passenger pigeons once considered the most abundant species perhaps in the whole world or Carolina uh, parakeets. Next. This is a, another New Yorker cartoon. I guess you could say it's funny, but not funny. Um, but this suggests the, the threat uh, to many birds today, in this case from global warming, uh, birds like the salt marsh sparrow, which endangered by rising sea levels. Um, <clears throat> a number of writers have written uh, and even used the term anthro Anthropocene. Um, as a name for our age, meaning this is the age in which humans so dominate the entire earth uh, that virtually no organism, certainly no bird is untouched by them. Um, some birds are mostly, <laughs> most certainly endangered uh, by human effects, especially loss of habitat. Next. But there is a brighter side. Uh, not all of this abundance has been lost. Uh, some can still be preserved. Um, this is another photo of a northern gannet colony with two mating gannets. Uh, a colony a little bit larger. Next. This is a black skimmer with a chick. Uh, trying to increase the skimmer population. This is the bird that so astonished Champlain and his crew in Cape Cod. Um, it's still with us in Massachusetts, uh, sometimes seen at Plum Island, more commonly seen in Cape Cod. <coughs> Next. Uh, but I think there's also hope in young birders. This is actually a photo from a group called Citizen Schools uh, in Boston. Uh, Brookline Bird Club has a book fund. We donated money to this group of volunteers that are trying, trying to bring uh, nature in Boston, nature and birds to school children in Boston. Um, I'm going to read a, uh, a passage. I have a chapter on geezer birding, which is what it's like to bird as a geezer, uh, but actually shifts and focuses on um, the legacy we can leave as birders. This is the very end of that, that chapter. I know only that we must all help to cultivate young birders, whatever their gender or color. It's the best legacy we can leave. Not a life list, but a new generation that will love birds and strive to preserve them. And I have to add, this is, uh, I'll tell you a little anecdote. This is the kind of thing uh, that makes me love being a writer. 
uh, I got an email message three days, two, three days ago uh, from a young woman named Juliana, uh, <coughs> who I've never met. She's 20 years old. Uh, I think she was reacting to this chapter in my book where I expressed concern that a lot of young people uh, are not much interested not only in birds, but in the natural world generally and may not be exposed to it. Uh, <coughs> and she wrote me a very long, very sweet, heartening message, uh, partly saying she enjoyed my book, uh, partly describing some birds she'd just seen, uh, but mostly telling me uh, <coughs> that she thinks there is hope uh, in young people like her who do love birds, who are very concerned about climate change and working to prevent it. Um, I wrote her back, uh, I hope a very gracious response because her message meant a lot to me. Uh, but it struck me afterwards uh, that it was sort of upside down. This is, uh, I feel for young people these days, we've left them a lot of huge problems to deal with. They're now going through a pandemic uh, where they face grave restrictions on their movement at a time in their life that should be the most free and the most adventurous. Um, so yeah, I kind of feel for the struggles they're going through, but here's a young woman uh, who is offering me hope and telling me to be hopeful. Uh, I felt it should have been the other way around. Um, and I think that's something uh, we owe to the younger generation is to find hope in ourselves and pass it along. Um, I'm going to read the very last chapter of my book, which expresses that sentiment. Um, next. Uh, this is a photo of an oven bird, actually a type of warbler, sometimes confused with a thrush. Uh, this figure is in its very last, uh, this is the last paragraph of my book. <clears throat> Begins with a quotation from the poet Gary Snyder. Nature is not a place to visit, it is home. Our physical and psychic health is inseparable from the health of our home. If our home becomes degraded, if we lose marshes and meadows, whippoorwills and towies, we lose something vital to being human. In Robert Frost, The Oven Bird, a warbler sings about the end of spring abundance and the coming of fall. Quote, the question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. Our home has been diminished, but nature keeps trying to adapt, revealing mysteries and new realms to explore. There's a story that on his deathbed, Thoreau was asked by a friend if he could glimpse the hereafter. One world at a time, Thoreau answered, one world at a time. And I'd like to close by reading uh, one final passage. This is, I guess, a bonus passage. This is not from my book, uh, <clears throat> but it was just published in the New England Journal, uh, Bird Observer, uh, an excellent journal. Uh, I'm on the board of the magazine and board members were asked to uh, send in some reflections on birding safely and sanely uh, in the pandemic. Uh, my writing is usually kind of labored and I'll work sentences to death. Uh, this one just caught me in the spirit. I wrote it in one sitting. Uh, next, it does refer to my book, so I'll return to uh, <coughs> The cover image of my book. Next. There you go. Uh, this is called, uh, let me get a drink here. This is called Whippoorwill Dream. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? At dusk, a barred owl calls from the woods behind our home in West Gloucester. Another owl responds, less articulate, a tad hysterical a mix of bawling, bawling, bawling toddler and delirious coyote. Who cooks ah, grah, 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 we, we all? Closer, an Eastern screech owl introduces a soft shivering whinny as a light motif. After a while, I go back in the house to watch a news report. Sickness and death stati statistics, grief, tear grass, rage, solidarity. Back on the deck, I hear no owls, but under a full moon, another voice reaches out from inside the darkness, cadenced, relentlessly determined to be heard.
For moments, there is no pandemic, no nation reckoning with its racial history and future, nothing but a sound beckoning in the wind. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill, whippoorwill. I love that whippoorwills exist. On the cover of my book, Flight Calls, a beautiful Audubon painting captures their postures, a tail flashing white in flight. The chapter Whippoorwill Synchronicity tells the story of a strange conjunction between a whippoorwill in our yard, legendary local birders Jerry Susie and Larry Jodry, and a haunting whippoorwill chorus at the end of William Faulkner's story, Barn Burning, uh, which by the way, I highly recommend. The ancient sound transports me back in time, before Europeans came to North America, before the first people on our continent moving east reached the Mississippi River. The eons when woodlands resemble, resounded with whippoorwills with no humans to hear them. Native American tribes named the bird onomatopoetically. In rural novels like Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, The Yearling, and Elizabeth Maddock Roberts, The Time of Man, generations pass on the knowledge that the whippoorwill's first song signals the time for planting. Now, strangers across Eastern North America are joined together at night by the same instant thrill of recognition. I hear a whippoorwill. The bird sings on. I've been watching a panel of six blackbirders on Blackbirders Week. Their discussion is delightfully ordinary. They could be any birders anywhere, telling stories and making jokes about warblers, rambunctious blue jays, grackles testing the boundaries of dissonance, neighborhood night jars. It's a vision of a future to work for, a time when it would be mundane to see black people gathered to chat about birds, a time when anyone can know the freedom to go birding without fear the freedom to walk along, alone down a dark country road to get a closer li listen to whippoorwills. <clears throat> the bird is still singing when I go to bed. What songs will be part of the soundscape in my patch a century from now? Will the people who come after me know the songs of Eastern towies, Eastern meadowlarks, Eastern whippoorwills? I've been birding alone during this pandemic, missing old friends, never quite unentangled from anxiety, but I'm encouraged by all the people suddenly attuned to the birds around them. They share their excitement on Facebook, a Baltimore Oriole at the hummingbird feeder, my first rose-breasted grosbeak. Was that a whippoorwill I heard? They're paying attention. We don't need to go on field trips to find nature. Nature is wherever we live. <clears throat> when I wake before first light, the whippoorwill is still there. Never hope more than you work, says pioneering, pioneering aviator Burl Markham in West with the Night. Whatever else it may be, the whippoorwill song is a work song. This bird is not giving up. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for joining me. That's the presentation. <laughs>